leaks um, as they may or may not be relevant to the to the individual of the sections. Um, but you'll probably have a quiz on them sometime next week. A surprise quiz. Okay. Uh, okay. So today's today's lecture is. First, an overview of cranial nerves, um, and then I'll talk in more detail about the first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, and the second one, which is the optic nerve. Uh, this one, obviously, we'll get around to paying more attention to, and what I talk about today when we dissect the orbit in a few weeks, and likewise, this one when we bisect the head and look at the nasal cavity in a little bit more detail, um, but, but that's the way things are sorting out. However, it's time to start learning cranial nerves, uh, the names of them for a start, what they do, uh, where they come from on the brain, and most significantly, how they get from inside the cranial cavity to whatever they happen to be innervating, whether it's an eyeball muscle or a tongue or the back of the throat or the ear or whatever. Um, there are lots of pathway questions. And these things all start out somewhere inside the cranial cavity, and as you know from, from the, the skull um, days, there are lots of holes in the skull, and in many of those holes have cranial nerves passing through them as they go from the brain out to various parts of the head, neck, face, and in the case of the vagus nerve, obviously the, the thorax and abdomen. Um, any books you have will probably have a huge section uh, the textbook by Moore um, on page 627 to 656 is a fairly detailed review of the cranial nerves one by one, where they come from, how they get to the, where they're going, uh, all the foramina they go to, and what they do when they get there. Grant's Atlas likewise has a, a whole section that, that had devoted to one cranial nerve after the next, after the next. Uh, if you have the Stearns core concepts, there's pages and pages dealing to that. If you have, most any anatomy book you have is going to have a whole section on cranial nerves that will go through them one by one. Um, today I'm just going, like I said, I'm going through them in, a, in the broadest sense and then specifically on these two. Okay, first of all, um, all of the heads innervated by cranial nerves except for some of the somatic sensory that you already know um, from the previous previous uh, lectures. You remember that uh, the parts of the cervical plexus, right, come up and, and innervate the area just in front of the ear and below the ear, the area behind the ear. You know the lesser occipital nerve and greater auricular nerve, whether you, you may have even found them in your course of your dissection of uh, the posterior triangle that are coming from down here. And then way, way back um, at the beginning of the course, you saw some of these, maybe some of these nerves that were innervating the back of the head, uh, the skin and area back there, somatic sensory, um, or dorsal rami, one of the few th bits of dorsal rami that we've actually seen in this, in this dissection. Okay, so there are 12 pairs. There's all one each, for each cranial nerve, there's a right and a left. Uh, starting with number one, the olfactory nerve. Number two, the optic nerve. You can figure out this is smell. This is vision. These are referred to as special sensory. Number three is a really busy one. Um, it's motor, but it goes to a whole wide range of muscles that you find within the eye or near the eye in particular, as well as some muscles that are actually within, within the eye itself. Four is an easy one, it's the trochlear nerve. It innervates only a single muscle that moves the eye. Number five, you already know, but from various bits and pieces, is the trigeminal. It's you're gonna do chewing muscles. You get a lecture on it next Monday. Uh, and it does some muscles that you see in the in the lower part of the uh, in the lower part of the mandible. It's a digastric. Uh, and then it does one muscle in the ear and that it has this huge sensory component that, that innervates uh, a, lot of, a lot of parts of the, of the whole face that you heard about last week. Um, number six is another easy one. It only does a single muscle that moves the eye. 
Number seven is a very busy one. You'll get a whole lecture on that next Wednesday. It does the muscles of facial expression that you'll be dissecting today. It does a little bit of digastric, a little bit of stylohyoid, some of these muscles you know. And then it goes to a variety of glands, the lacrimal gland, the submandibular gland that many of you chopped out or hopefully chopped out the other day, and then another salivary gland. So it's a, a really complicated one. So we'll have a whole lecture on that next Wednesday. Oh, it has a little bit of taste in it too, just to throw a little something extra in there. Uh, number eight is mainly concerned with is just hearing and balance. You don't see much of it in the course of your dissection. It zips into the ear region and, and stays there. Uh, number nine is another sort of complicated one. It's the glossopharyngeal. It's mainly concerned with the, the back of the throat and also the parotid gland, which you'll see today on the side of the side of the face, uh, various bits of, of sensory innervation in the throat. Your old friend the vagus, which you know well from all the things it does in the course of the going through the thorax and the abdomen, um, but it also does a bunch of things in the throat, and as you recall from the recurrent laryngeal, it also does, it's going to do the larynx, so it's a very busy nerve. And bits and pieces of, of sensory uh, from a variety of places. Some visceral sensory from the GI tract and some sensory in the back of the throat. Number 11, you know well, the accessory, it's a pretty straightforward, just motor to trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. And then number 12, you saw a bit in your dissection the other day. It's a motor nerve and it's concerned with the muscles of the tongue. So you should know all these and know what they do. There are various mnemonics for knowing the cranial nerves. There are other mnemonics for knowing whether they're sensory, motor, or both. Okay, so what do they do overall? Okay, so they, they do five, five types of things. First of all, it's fairly straightforward. Somatic motor to striated muscles, right? That's just what uh, we talked about a lot in the, in the nerves that we saw in the, in the trunk. In the cranial region, there are cranial nerves concerned with striated muscle. Uh, these include muscles that move the tongue, muscles that move the eyeball in various directions. As you know, muscles that move the head on the neck, sternocleidoid trapezius. Uh, muscles, these, these muscles of the face that you'll dissect today and you heard about. They move the jaws, some move the jaws, number, number five. And various little muscles that you'll see in the larynx and the pharynx and the palate. So that's a fairly straightforward somatic motor. Um, as you can see, there are, as I mentioned, there are numerous of the cranial nerves that have uh, somatic motor fibers, they're going to somatic motor fibers. In fact, many, many. The first two do not. Uh, number seven, these are all special sensory, but everybody else um, has some a bit of motor here and there. There are also nerves that, some of the cranial nerves have bits that are doing visceral motor. They're carrying parasympathetic fibers to glands, like salivary glands, uh, and to various smooth muscle that, that may be in blood vessels or various viscera. There are just a few, there's four that have that function, and you should know that. Okay, visceral sensory. Um, again, this is, you know, you, you, you talk, we talked about visceral sensory in the abdomen and in the thorax. And in the head and neck, there are other bits of visceral sensory. There's something called a carotid body, which is a little thing that sits in the bifurcation between the internal and external carotid. Measures aspects of, of, of blood, uh, sort of oxygen, carbon dioxide in the blood. And then there's a big swelling, the carotid sinus, which is a swelling right there where the two, where the two split. And this is visceral sensation, um, and it's covered by cranial nerves, and various bits there are going to parts of the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea. And including, obviously, vagus has some visceral sensory fibers that go all the way through the, the GI tract. So just general purpose somatic sensory. Um, obviously, there's somatic sensory in the skin of your face. There's the skin of the skin of your chin. 
Uh, there's, there's somatic sensory in, in parts of your mouth, there's somatic sensory in your teeth, obviously, and this is covered by, by cranial nerves. And then finally there are this, what we call the special sensory. Uh, smell is, not, is, is a special type of sensing. Vision is a type of sensing. Taste is sensing. Hearing and associated with hearing is balance. There are structures in the inner ear that, that tell you how fast you're moving or whether you're moving to the right or the left or up or down. Okay, so there are five different things that some cranial nerves do. Uh, there's no cranial nerve that does all of this particularly the ones that are, that are concerned with vision and smell that we're talking about today, they're, they're pretty specialized, that's about all they do. Uh, taste, well, some of those, many of those do lots of different things, and hearing and balance is restricted to, to one cranial nerve, but, but many cranial nerves can do different things. Some of them are strictly motor, some of them are motor and sensory, some of them are somatic motor sensory, and plus a little bit of, uh, of, of of uh, visceral motor in there as well. Okay, today we're talking about one and two. Number one, the olfactory nerve, which is special sensory, which is smell, and the optic nerve, which is also special sensory, which is vision. Okay, cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve, concerned with smell. So the sensory cells are actually an epithelium in the roof of the nasal cavity. Although you have a fairly large area in the nasal cavity, particularly if you count all those sinuses that are, that are extensions off of the nasal cavity, um, nevertheless, the sensory cells are concentrated mainly in the, in the roof, and I'll show you a picture in a minute. So axons pass um, from this epithelium in the nasal cavity through the cribriform plate, you recall the cribriform plate is the sort of this perforated thing in the anterior cranial cavity. It's got a lot of holes in it. They say approximately 20 on each side, close enough. Um, so are these filaments, the called the filia olfactoria, if you're into Latin, or olfactory filaments that pass the information from the epithelium in the nasal cavity through the cribriform plate, sitting on top of the cribriform plate is a, is a swelling known as the olfactory bulb. You'll see that when we, when we pull the brains out. And then that's where the ax of these filaments, uh, the axons of these filaments that are coming from the nasal cavity are where they synapse. And the olfactory bulb is the front end of this long sort of flat structure known as the olfactory tract which connects the brain, the forebrain to the olfactory bulb. And so these parts are actually extensions of the brain. Right? So the olfactory nerves are the parts that are in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the nasal cavity, and then there's still these filaments up that go to the bulb, and the bulb and tract are bits of the brain that have extended out in the anterior cranial cavity to collect the information. So let's look at this. So here's the underside of a brain, which you'll see. And this is the olfactory tract, extending forward to this, and then has this big swelling called the olfactory bulb. And that swelling is sitting in, the right and the left are each sitting in the cribriform plate. And the cribriform plate's part of what bone? Ethmoid. Ethmoid, good. Okay, so if you lift up the olfactory bulb, you see the cribriform plate with all the little holes in it. Here's exactly what it looks like. It's a photograph of the underside <coughs> of the brain. So the olfactory tract is extending anteriorly and these bulbs are sitting in the cribriform plate. So here's a, a, a drawing of a cross section. So here's the, the epithelium up in here that's collecting the, the sense, the molecules that, that carry that information. And here are these, well, here's the tract coming down, the bulb sitting in the cribriform plate, these olfactory filaments, and then they're extending down into the upper part of the nasal cavity. And as a group, they are what they are technically the olfactory nerve, because this is technically a part of the brain. Okay, here's a cross-section, is what I was 
telling you that. So here's a, looking inside the nose, right? You have these superior, middle, and inferior conchi. Okay, these scroll-like structures. There's the nasal septum at the midline. And the epithelium that has the olfactory, bits of the olfactory nerve is, is just this upper part way up here. So there's lots of air traveling all around here, but you don't smell with this part of your nose. Only the stuff that gets up here in the, in the top. And it's this nasal mucosa here, which collects the, the molecules that are, that are carrying scent information. And then it's passed through these filaments through the holes in the fruitiform plate up to the bulb. Cross section basically showing the same thing. This is the part of the nasal cavity that is sensitive to smell. Okay, so that's that's that one. Uh, smell is a, is a real of all the senses. Smell is the one that's probably most poorly understood. Um, it turns out that that there's enormous numbers of genes um, that are related to smell, and there's there's lots and lots of variation within people, as you probably know, uh, and among different animals. There's characterizing how much smell is driven by structure of the nerve, how much of it is, is by the genome, is, is a really complex and an area of a lot of research. The smell is obviously tremendously important um, reproductively, obviously in terms of locating food, for animals in terms of locating predators and all sorts of things. Um, but we understand probably less about that than we do of vision or balance or hearing, because it's sort of hard to, it's harder to characterize and test. Okay, moving on. Number two, the optic nerve. Okay, again, it's, it's one of the simpler ones in the sense that it only does one thing. It's concerned with vision. The sensory, I'm sure you know, the sensory receptors involved with vision are located in the retina, which is a layer within the eyeball. We'll see pictures in a few minutes. Uh, the olfactory nerve itself uh, is surrounded by meninges, okay, um, all the way up to the eyeball. So when you see the optic nerve traveling at, from the cranial cavity up to the eyeball, it's actually surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid and meninges, just like the brain and the spinal cord. The optic nerve passes from the orbit through the optic canal. I think that was a maybe on the skull quiz, uh, or going backwards, 